I guess got a little going here. I'm just so delighted you were courageous enough to come and be here today. Um, I want us to go to First Kings, the eighth chapter, to start out here. I want to talk to you about pestilence today. Not that, huh? First Kings, the eighth chapter. First Kings, chapter eight. That's where we're going to start. We're going to wind up over in the Revelation, but we're going to start way back yonder. You remember that uh, you have the three in the uh, books of history. You have two boys and a girl, three sets of twins. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. And uh, First Kings chapter eight is where I'd like to ask you to go. Direct your attention there today. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> In 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, beginning down at uh, verse 35, King Solomon is uh, at the dedication of the physical temple. And this is what he was praying as he talked to the Lord in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter. When the heavens are shut up and there's no rain, because they've sinned against thee. And they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sins. When you do afflict them, now we're going to find out that there are times that God afflicts His people, bringing correction and discipline. Then He says, Hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants, and of the people of Israel indeed. Teach them the good way in which they should walk, and send rain on the land which you've given your people for an inheritance. Verse 37, If there's a famine in the land, if there's pestilence, if there's blight or mildew, locusts or grasshopper, if an enemy besieges them in the land of the cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness is there, whatever prayer or supplication is made by any man or by all the people of Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and spreading his hands toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive, verse 39 says, act and render to each according to all his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou alone dost know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they may fear thee in all the days they live in the land which you've given to our fathers. We know that they were possessing a physical land. We are possessing a spiritual land. We've been seeing in the scripture. 1 Corinthians 3 9 says that we're God's field. The seed of God's word is sown onto the soil of our heart. And it takes root in us and it transforms us into His image. And so when we're singing, come live in me, that's exactly what He desires to do. If we'll repent and humble ourselves and cry out to Him, He will come and live in us and change our lives. Because He says, as Solomon prayed, you know the hearts of all men. But if there's a pestilence, He said, we in our hearts, we can humble ourselves and we can cry out to you. And you'll hear Go to Jeremiah chapter 34 in the books of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Skip over Psalms and Proverbs and you'll get there. Jeremiah the 34th chapter. Jeremiah 34 verse 8. Isaiah, Jeremiah who wrote Lamentations. We've been singing that every Sunday in our Bible Basics class. We'll do it again next Sunday. <clears throat> Jeremiah 34, beginning down at verse 8. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were in Jerusalem, to proclaim release to them, that each man, verse 9, should set free his male servant, and each man his female servant, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, so that no one should keep them, a Jew, his brother, in bondage. And what they're talking about here is every seven years, there was a release that was proclaimed. And if people had become indebted to someone, and uh, because of that, uh, they were serving them in order to pay back the debt that they owed, after seven years, the debts were all forgiven. And the people made an agreement, as King Zedekiah led them so, and uh, the people made an agreement that they were going to do that. Well, it says in verse 10, all the officials and the people obeyed who'd entered into covenant. Each man should set free his male servant and uh, each man his female servant so that no one should keep them any longer in bondage. 
They obeyed and sent them free. But afterward, they turned around and took back the male servants and female servants whom they set free. Well, we set them free, but now, hey, no, we still have this paper. You owe us something. You come back here and you have to serve us again. And brought them into subjection for male servants and female servants. So that's what they did. They all agreed, yes, that's what God told us to do. We're going to do that. But now we want them back. Oh, gosh, I'm having to do laundry now. I've got to go mow the yard. Who's going to do my grocery shopping for me? I really enjoyed having these people subservient to me. I'm not liking this. Bring them back and put them into bondage. But you see, God pays attention to all these things that are going on. And uh, those who uh, are uh, deceitful and think they're getting away with stuff, guess what? There is a day coming, the Scripture says, when you will stand and give account of all of your deeds, even the words you speak, you'll give account to the Lord for on the day of judgment. And in verse 13, the message goes on through Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I made a covenant with your forefathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage, saying, at the end of seven years, each of you shall set free his Hebrew brother who's been sold to you and has served you six years. You shall send him out free from you. But your forefathers did not obey me or incline their ear. Although recently you turned and did what was right in my sight, each man proclaimed and released to his neighbor, you had made a covenant before them in the house which is called by my name, yet you turned and profaned my name, verse 16 says, and each man took back his male servant, his female servant, whom they had set free according to their desire, and you brought them into subjection to be your male and female servants. Therefore, thus says the Lord, God's going to have a say in this, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming release, each to his brother and man, to his neighbor. Behold, I am proclaiming a release to you, declares the Lord. I'm releasing you to the sword and to the pestilence and to the famine and I will make you a terror to all kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts just like God did with Abraham in Genesis 15 when God made a covenant with Abraham, the new covenant with him. They cut the calf in two. These people had done the same thing. And the officials of Judah, in verse 19, the officials of Jerusalem, court officers, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their life, and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. Now, understand that while he's prescribing uh, something that is going to take place physically for them, it is an illustration spiritually of what God does with those of us who rebel against His guidelines in our lives here, even though we may claim a walk with Him. Who are the birds of the sky that in the parable of the soils come and steal the seed out of people's hearts when Jesus told that parable? Satan. Satan, the powers of darkness. Who are the beasts of the earth? Paul told the elders at Ephesus, the last meeting he had with them, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. He was talking about the false teachers that are going to come. And this is part of the judgment. The powers of darkness stealing God's word out of people's hearts and that the false teachers are going to rule and reign and have dominion over the people of God. So while this physically was happening to them, it is a picture spiritually of what's going on today. You say, well, Rick, that's a, law, that's a far stretch. Well, wait a minute. Go read 1 Corinthians 10. Paul says everything that happened to them back in the old days was written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You think you've got a franchise on the things of God? You think you've got a handle on all of it? He said, you better take heed if you think you've got it all worked out lest you fall. And we see Jesus was teaching the same thing there. And so, turn now way over to Revelation. You say, well, that was a long time ago, you know, uh, Rick. Well, let's go to the Revelation, the very last chapter, uh, the very last book, excuse me, in the Scriptures. Let's go to chapter 2. So part of God's judgment on His people who were disobeying Him, <clears throat> particularly it seems to be the most egregious thing is the way they treat their fellow man. Remember, Jesus said the whole Bible and all the teaching of Scripture boils down to two things. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, isn't that interesting that that makes a cross? Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's everything in the Bible boils down to that. 
And it's amazing how man has taught us how we can tap dance around those things and say, well, that's really only referring to people that go to my church and believe what I believe in. So those are the only ones that I really have to, and the rest are just, uh, you know, cannon fodder out there. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Do you remember, do you remember when the religious leaders, when Jesus, uh, when Jesus told them, he said, what's the great commandment? He said, love God, love your neighbor. And then the guy was trying to justify himself. Yeah, but who's my neighbor? Yeah. So he's trying to find some wheel room in here to get it to Do you remember what Jesus, what parable he spoke, uh, what story he told to illustrate who your neighbor was? That's right. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And when he finished the parable of the Good Samaritan, remember the priest was too busy. The guys, the robbers have attacked him. He may have feared for his life. They might still be hiding in the hills and they might come and attack me. And so the Pharisee went by and the, and the half-breed, uh, outcast of society, Samaritan, had compassion on him, bandaged his wounds, put some money at the end and said, take care of him. When I travel back through, I'll take care of that. And then Jesus simply asked the question, so who was, who was neighbor to the guy there? And then he said, go and do, do likewise. So who's your neighbor? Anyone you encounter that's in need. That's who your neighbor is. In Revelation, the second chapter, are you there? Verse 19. He's writing, uh, well, 18 tells us it's the uh, church in Thyatira. The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, or in his feet are like burnished bronze. Uh, some of you recognize that. That's exactly the description of what happened in Genesis 15 when God made a covenant with Abraham. It's a description. We know that Jesus himself was there. Verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, perseverance, your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she doesn't want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Verse 23. I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the heart. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you the rest in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching. Who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them. I place... No other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast till I come. He who overcomes, he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, and will give him the morning star. And he simply says, he who has ears, let him hear. There's a whole lot in here. We could spend a couple hours on what's in here. I'm not going to do that right now because we're actually going to study this passage of Scripture and when we study about the heads of protection and the order of God, this is a significant passage. I simply want to call your attention that when this occurs, according to verse 23, God is in the business of sending pestilence. He's no Santa Claus, folks. We need to get over this thing that American Christianity has taught about God's, you know, the cosmic genie who hops and does what you want. And he's a big Santa Claus in the sky because he's not. He's absolutely God Almighty. And he's very serious that people follow the guidelines that he's given, particularly as it comes. You say you love me, then show it by the way you treat your fellow man. Turn to the 18th chapter, still in Revelation. Revelation 18. <clears throat> Revelation 18, verse 1. Uh, John is still having these uh, visions. And in Revelation 18, verse 1, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place of demons prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. And we know from the indications in the Scripture, Babylon is talking about churches that are not teaching the truth, they're not teaching God's Word, and they're teaching uh, spiritual harlotry. And it says the whole world is influenced by her. Verse 3, All the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, 
And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. That tells me that God's people were still in this church. Some of God's people were in there. Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. Okay, God is still allowing plagues when you get to toward the end of the revelation. God is still using that as judgment or as discipline depending on what the occasion calls for it for those who repudiate His Word. Well, Rick, this sounds pretty gloomy. Uh, maybe I should have stayed home today and, and protected my stash of toilet paper. <laughs> right? Okay. All right, I, I figured you might uh, relate to that. <laughs> I want you to go with me to Psalm 91 because, folks, this is good news. What we're learning about is this is good news. These things of famine and pestilence and all, it's been going on since human beings have been on the face of the earth. But what hope is there? How can we say, you know, life is good because God is? Why can we sing that we must be fools to think there's anything good? Listen, there's a lot. There's an abundance of good that's offered. And Bob Nelson, thank you so much, brother, for sharing that. I had no idea what he was going to share today. So I won't have to talk about tithing. I haven't talked about it in the four years that I've been here. I've never heard you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't. I've never heard Pastor Jim talk about it. <laughs> It was so funny, when I was pastor among the uh, uranium miners in, Co in southwestern Colorado. Uh, they were all convinced that the only reason the church was there was to try to, to get money from them. And so, uh, so we never did talk about it, but there are important principles of God there. And Bob, thank you uh, for giving your own testimony about what God's done for you and how He's provided. And all I can say is amen. amen. He has always provided for us. I do remember in uh, Lynn and I's uh, next month, or May will be 46 years since we've been married. There was one night when we served the last food that we had in our house. When our uh, at that time we only had three of our four sons, and uh, and we didn't know we weren't going to have funds for several days to uh, to figure out where we were going to get some food. And I was trying to decide: well, am I going to have to go be a beggar? Or what am I going to have to do? And that was the one night in our 46 years that Lynn's mom and dad showed up at our house. The only time they ever came out of state to visit us. They came from Mesa all the way to Klamath Falls, Oregon, where I was pastor at the time. And they brought coupons he had won uh, because he was parts manager at Brown & Brown Chevrolet in Mesa. And they had three $100 certificates for Safeway oh, grocery store. Wow. And we went to the store that night. <laughs> And the kids had food. We bought some toilet paper. <laughs> and the, and the, kids, and the kids had food. That's the closest that we have come in our 46 years together of going without. And we've been through some challenging things where we've been pushed out of some churches and I've had to go dig ditches and wash toilets and do whatever we have to in order to be free to speak God's Word. Whether it's what agrees with what... Uh, the you know leadership and authorities uh, want to hear or not, and uh, so that's what we've had to do through our years. But God has always provided Amen. for us Amen. and given us that which we can share with others. Amen. Psalm ninety-one. Listen to this. This is good news, folks. Okay, this is good news. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. To be in something shadow. You have to be pretty close to it. That's what he's describing. And so if in our hearts we're crying out to God and we're drawing near to Him, you can go to church ceremonies and not be doing this from your heart, folks. Ask me how I know, okay? I've experienced that. I've been there. I've been guilty. I don't want to go back to that. But if in your heart you're drawing near to God, He will welcome you into His shadow. In verse 2, I'll say to the Lord, My refuge, My fortress, my God in whom I trust. I want you to know there are many gods in America today. I don't trust in what's in my bank account. It may be worth nothing tomorrow. Okay? 
I don't trust what's in there. I don't trust the government to be God to take care of me. Like many in places of leadership want us to do. They love having people subservient to them. Shame on them. That's the reason when the communist revolution swept throughout Russia, they killed the pastors. I know there was one place where they lined up all the priests and said, deny God, deny Jesus, or you die. And they were all slaughtered. Because they wanted the government to be God. And people not to trust in God, but to trust in the government. But you see, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress in whom I trust. For in verse 3, it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He's the one who spares you and saves you. Jesus touched people that were under quarantine and healed them because the power of God was released through Him. And oh, that we would walk so close to God that His power could be released through us. We get a measure of it. There are a lot of people for whom we prayed right up here that have been just miraculously and phenomenally healed. You know, and I know that a lot of people don't like it when I point these things out to them, but some of the most amazing things that have happened. Dorothy, I haven't embarrassed you in a long time. <laughs> because this happened about three and a half years ago, but since, since I got you here, I'm going to just embarrass you again. So on a Wednesday night, she shows up and she has a, she's having trouble breathing. She can't walk up the hill to see her neighbors. And a year before, they'd run some dye and they said, well, if you start having these problems, that means you've got to plug carotid artery. Was it the right side or the left? The left. Okay. I want to be accurate. It's the left side. And so we said, you know what? Let's pray and ask God. Let's see what God will do. And so we lay hands on. And here we are praying and talking to God. And right in the middle of it, she starts blurting things out. She goes... My neck's getting hot. My neck's getting hot. <laughs> Dorothy, be quiet. We're talking to God. Nobody was touching her on the neck. And in a couple days she went in. They ran the dye test. And her carotid artery that had been, what percent plugged the year before? 58? 59%. The year before was completely 100% open. And she said, you know what's the greatest thing about it? I can walk to my friend's house and I don't have to sit down and breathe. Aww. Isn't that awesome? Amen. God doing things like that. They're really wonderful. And see, we need to keep reminding people of these things because He is the one who supplies our need. When we look to Him and learn to tap into His resources. And I have to tell you, I'm not satisfied with our level of experience of physical supernatural healing. I don't think it's quite what they had in Acts yet. And that's what tells me we need to keep pressing on to know God. We don't build monuments about these things, you know. Michael Sorowski, after 20 years, uh, just a few weeks ago, taking his hearing aids out, and when we prayed for him, something went through his head, and he heard the sound, he thought we heard it. I mean, all of these things, these are simply little nuggets that God says, you're on the right path. Amen. Keep seeking me. That's what we want to do. Keep seeking him. Amen? Amen. That's what he's asking for. God says, I have so much more for you. Keep seeking me. He's the one who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and deadly pestilence. Verse 4, still in Psalm 91. He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness and shield as a bulwark. You'll not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noon. Don't miss verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, and no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your tent. For he'll give his angels charge concerning you and guard you in your way. We're going to study about this hedge of protection of angels this week. We're going to see what the scripture says about it and what the conditions are that we need to align ourselves with in order to receive those benefits from God. We don't go earn it, but we have to do some things in our heart to be in tune with him and be in that place where the Lord wants us to be so that he can speak to us and, and he can guide us through all of these things. I want you to now go with me just a couple more verses here. Matthew 13. Uh, in our Bible Basics class, we 
studied through this parable, the parable of the soils. Jesus described four kinds of soils. And uh, for those of you who haven't been with us very much, uh, sorry we don't have time to go over this. We've spent months studying this passage of Scripture. Very important because Jesus said there are some people to whom it is not granted to understand the things of God. And it might behoove you to find out what those are so that you can avoid that. And he says the problem is that people have hardened hearts. And in Matthew 13, as he describes the four kinds of soil, uh, one, the birds, it's hardened soil and the birds steal it. Others, it's rocky and there's no depth. And when the plant uh, takes root and the sun comes out and it's scorched and it dies away. And he's talking about what God's Word does in your heart. And then it says in verse 7, Matthew 13, verse 7, Others fell among the thorns. The thorns came up and choked them out. Where we, He wants us to be is the next kind of soil. Others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Reproducing the fruit of Jesus. The, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life is what the objective is. Well, what's that fruit of the Holy Spirit? Well, it... Paul gives a great description in Galatians 5. There are nine qualities, but it's one single fruit. It's kind of like a jewel that's being held up. Say with me those nine qualities, those of you that know it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit that he wants to be born out of our lives. But did you see that in verse 7 there are thorns that choke him out and keep the seed of God's Word from producing its fruit? Well, since these thorns can choke it out, it might be a good idea for us to know what some of those thorns are. And Jesus tells us in verse 22, He interprets it for His disciples. That's for you, if you're listening, if you have your ears open. The one on whom seed, the seed of God's Word, was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the Word of God. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches chokes the Word and it does not produce its fruit. Do you think our world has any worries today? <laughs> oh my goodness. You see, there can be people who've received God's Word who claim a relationship and a walk with God, but it's not going to produce its fruit if you allow the worries of the world to grow up and to choke it out. The world today is filled with fear. The world today is controlled by fear. Now see, if you think that the opposite of faith is being an atheist, you'd be mistaken, okay? The opposite of faith is an unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. And all through the Scripture, God says to His people, do not fear, or the short version, fear not. Over and over and over again, he says that. Why does he say that? Because I'm a shield to you. You're going to rest in the shadow of my wings. And yet our world is driven by fear. Last spring, one of the things that we learned about the dangers of the way we choose to live our life is this. If you are led in your life, by your feelings, your emotions, you will be controlled by Satan because that is part of his domain from Genesis 3. From the dust of the earth God created man and he was cursed to go on his belly. It's not the physical snake, but it's a picture of what he's like. And his domain is the flesh nature, which is feelings. I remember when I graduated high school, 1972. Some of you, oh man, you were kids. Over here, like, wow, you're an antique. <laughs> it's just a matter of perspective. And I remember the next day, I did not feel like a high school graduate. I didn't. But when I left home with all of my earthly goods in my car, to go off to college, I'm kind of like, hmm, I guess I graduated high school. I remember October of 1976. My wife said that year, my birthday is in October on the 16th. She said, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, a little boy would just be great. 
<laughs> three days late. She had her first labor pains, by the way, on my birthday, and three days later, our son Aaron was born. Let me tell you, when he was born, I was walking around in the days. I'm kind of like, I can't be a father. I'm not a dad. What? I don't feel like that. But guess what? A few sleepless nights. <laughs> By the way, all four of my sons baptized me at least once in the bed. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> she wasn't fast enough changing the diaper. So in the middle of the night, we get up, change the sheets, take showers, do all that. We did that four times. I guess that's why we didn't have any more kids, because we never learned this. <laughs> but you see, I didn't feel like a father. But after a while, I began to. Why? Because my emotions and my feelings yield to reality eventually. But if you're led by your emotions, you're in trouble. Because that's Satan's playground. And tragically, in my lifetime, the United States of America quit being led by rationality and thinking, and it's given itself over to feelings and emotions. Yeah, right. And one of the stupidest things that I hear, watch even a sporting event. Oh, that's right, they aren't having any more, are they? <laughs> I won't miss them. Anyway, they say, oh, you just won the Super Bowl, how do you feel? <laughs> so sad, so depressed. What a stupid question. And yet, that's what interviewers do, and that's called journalism today. How stupid. I don't give a... I wouldn't give a flip for what you feel because I know you're jubilant. I want to know, what do you think? I said, did you see the job that the guards and tackles did opening the holes so that our running back could get through? Did you see the work that our safeties did and shutting down their receivers that they couldn't score and take the, the lead of the game against us? I want to know what he's thinking. America wants to know how you feel. And so we're led by feelings. And that's why our country is in the absurd position that it's in today, acting out of hysteria instead of being rational and following some good guidelines to protect each other from the things that can be spread that happen every year. But when you're led by emotions, this is the kind of stupidity that you get. And American religious leadership bows right down to it and follows exactly the same thing. Because we don't want anybody to see us as being insensitive. Let me tell you, when you're led by your feelings, you are controlled by Satan. He's the God of this world and he uses feelings and emotions. So what's he going to get you to emote about this week? We emote. We emote. Yes, ma'am. And that's why you told us all along every now and then to not leave our brains outside when we come in. Absolutely. We come and God wants us to use our mind and our brain. Amen. But we need to be led by our heart. Our heart will influence what our mind does. And our heart, when it's set on God, will compel our feelings to line up with what God says. Amen. That's where He wants us to be, folks. And it's a great thing that God would put His Spirit in us and dwell in us. What a life. What an adventure. And I'll say, as I said when I started with you four years and one week ago, if you are bored in your relationship with God, you are deceived. It's the most exciting thing that can happen in the world to have a relationship with the living God in whom we trust and have our confidence in whatever sort of thing happens. We may get startled by something. You see, that's what snakes do. You know, we, we, we're kind of loose with our language. We say, oh, what? last time I saw a snake, it scared me. Well, what you mean is it startled you. But you don't run in fear. Oh, my goodness. Don't anybody ever go out of your house because there's danger out there. It's lurking. But you see, when we walk by faith, we have confidence in God not to do foolish things. Satan says, hey, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. Jesus said, nope. Because we're not to tempt God. He might just let you crush on the ground down there if you're going to be presumptuous of Him. But when you need to do something, 
I'm there. I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. And He's not going to forsake us now. Don't be led by your emotions. Take them captive and take dominion over them. And set your mind on the things of God. Lord, thank You for Your Word. It is life to us. It's medication to our bones. It's healing to our body. It's a lamp to our feet. a light to our path. And we rejoice, Lord, that we're going to continue to be victorious as we walk with You and walk in Your ways. Lord, may the stupidity that's going on in our nation, may that stupidity reveal to people they need to change how they do business and how they relate to the world around us. Lord, You want us to look to You first. And in all things, in every circumstance, every trial, every difficulty, to give thanks to You. And Lord, You are always faithful to sustain us through those things. Thank You that You're doing that. Now Lord, may we go from here and be wise as the powers of darkness, but as harmless with our motives being pure. As harmless as dust. And may we be found faithfully serving you and encouraging people to look to you and not to cower in fear from any of the things that may be going on out in the world out there. Lord, help us to shut off the stream of fear mongers out there and open up the Scriptures and draw close to you. God, we'll give you praise and glory that you care that much about us that you're going to get us through whatever challenges come. I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.